Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to sharing with you our journey. So uh, as we hit our 20th anniversary this year for the Human Disease Ontology, it's a long time for a, uh, a project of, of this scale, I got very reflective in thinking about um, how do we evolve, how do we address FAIR, how do we address uh, being uh, trustworthy. So I'm going to share with you a bit of our journey uh, and, and point out some of the things that have evolved over time uh, in, this, in this context of FAIR and trustworthy. Hopefully it will change. There we go. Okay, great. So the disease ontologist, to give you a little bit of introduction, it provides a standardized classification of human diseases. What does that mean? It means that uh, 20 years ago when we started this project, there were a handful of clinical vocabularies built for many reasons. None of them semantically driven, none of them ontologies. So we took on that task of identifying all these uh, sources of clinical information and then building a semantic uh, research tool that is both human readable and machine interpretable and this is our resource. This is our homepage I'm showing you right now and you can do many things on the site itself. You can search for diseases, look at the classification hierarchy we devised from these various clinical resources and etiology based classification and what that means is we looked at the cause of disease everywhere that we could find it and identify it. Uh, and integrated that information, and we continue to do so to today. Uh, I'm just showing you uh, an example of one of the pages we would put data together in. We provenance all of our data. We integrate and link to other clinical vocabularies, and this is an ongoing basis. We have monthly releases where we're continually to add uh, new information. About 700 new diseases are identified and integrated every year. Uh, we extensively cross-reference other obofoundry ontologies to define things like anatomy and phenotypes and other types of data. So you'll see all that kind of rich information in there as well. When we're building this information, we really think of it as a disease knowledge network, and I'm showing you here uh, one of our representations in, as a graph format. We really, it's interconnected data. When you're looking at, in this case, COVID-19, COVID-19 is a type of coronavirus infectious disease. There's many other types of um, uh, coronavirus, a number of other coronavirus infectious diseases, and there are also subtypes of COVID-19. And related to each of the disease terms, as I was saying, we can connect other information and they are connected rigorously with uh, terms from the relation ontology. This gives us a very strict, um, uh, defined relationships between each of these items that allows uh, inferences to be made. And uh, as a knowledge graph, uh, it is a, um, a rigorous system. It all is curated. Uh, there are no uh, the automated um, data additions, there's automation throughout our system to guide that curation, but all of the data added is manually added. It becomes very um, rich and very um, complex in its data, but it gives a lot of uh, different opportunities to mine that data and look for connections between diseases. That's our intent. Now I want to share this slide with you because it's talking a little bit about evolution. Many of us in this audience have started resources or maybe you're just beginning your career and you're, you're about to create a resource. This is the same journey that we went on. Uh, a number of us in the very beginning, way back 2003, 2005, started the project. We wanted to have a semantic way to capture this information. And as you can see, progress, see the progression from left to right, there's many milestones we hit through that time period I wanted to share with you. So, Building a community, we had to identify a common need. It was good for our projects that we developed the resource, but then if we want to grow from being our own resource to a community resource, it's a big step. Taking on the uh, understanding, learning from their communities, what they needed, uh, evolving with those needs. Um, and continuing to work with them. So our earliest funding was in 2008 with our first R01. We've been continuously funded to date. We're funded as a NIH genomic resource and knowledge base, which means our mission is to serve our community. We are uh, the source for nomenclature and disease terms for, I'll show you in a bit, but literally hundreds and hundreds of resources. Um, we do try and keep on top of who's using us, but every day we find a new one we didn't quite realize. So that's a wonderful thing as a resource. So as we progress through this, this, uh, prog this timeline, I also want to point out we had to think about how do we implement the resource with other collaborators? How do we circle back? that knowledge. When, um, for instance, in cancer, molecular subtypes became a new way of defining cancers a number of years ago, how did we 
but first test and then integrate a new data model within the system we had. How do we have that iterative evolution over time to make sure we're staying with the science, ahead of the science, staying up to date with the, the new diseases that are being uh, identified and integrated? How do you evolve? One of those things was to become a CC0 um, resource. We started CCBY4, like many resources, but realized that could be a bottleneck to uh, pharma, for instance, uh, for utilizing us. So we gave it all away, basically, uh, uh, for full use. And it's been a, a great decision for us. Um, it certainly increased our usage, but it's, again, allowed a lot of different types of uses. Um, and that was a personal decision for the group, but again, that's part of our Wikidata collaboration, trying to make it as open and as usable as possible. Now, thinking about these 20 years, I really wanted to give a, a, a bit of a background on the disease modeling that we've done. So we started quite simply. There are, and it's just a cartoon for fun, but there's a lot of different types of illnesses and diseases out there listed in various resources. All of them are not diseases. Um, breaking your foot, not a disease. Um, all, all sorts of things can be called symptoms or phenotypes or, or, or injuries, and, and they do get mixed up in different resources, right? So one of our jobs was really to look at uh, the clinical understanding of disease. It helps that I'm a geneticist by training. We have geneticists and clinicians on our team, and we have for the last 20 years. Again, we had to think of how are diseases categorized in different resources and to come up with this classification system. And then today, what I'm showing on the far right of the side is um, in our last five years, we've really been thinking about complex diseases, going beyond you know, gene, single gene diseases to really understanding the environmental influences of them. Uh, this year, we're really trying to tackle social determinants of health, thinking of having more insight in not just the features of diseases, but the mechanisms, again, to look at connections between diseases. When you're looking at uh, building a resource, you're often asked at the beginning, how do you know you're successful? Where, where, how do you judge yourself as successful? And I, and I can still remember the first time I was asked that at a, at a conference such as this, and it was like, oh, someone outside my group is using my resource. Fantastic, right? But as you grow and evolve, you'll all know that it's hard to, put, to pin this down. Um, so we have multiple methods we've devised over the years. Um, and fortunately right now, uh, we, we, in the last two years, we've devised a more automated method. And if you come to poster four, um, Alan Barron and our, and our team, he's gonna explain to you how we've made an automated um, set of steps that then is utilized to identify not only who's using us, but how they're using us. And so what I'm showing you here are a couple different figures. In the middle, it's a track record of our publications over, year, over the years. Not, not to ours, the ones citing us. So we, we go to some, some lengths to identify who's not just mentioning us in an article, which you all know they do, right? They don't cite you always. But who's, who mentions you, who cites you, who puts your website in. But we wanna know that information so we can identify how they're using us. And I'll show that on a subsequent slide. What I'm showing in the, the other figures is our usage geographically. Uh, we are quite interested in understanding from the literature information that we're pulling where and how other resources that are being built are, are using us and, and what's that distribution. So we did it both from the, the 1,700 plus publications that have currently cited us, going through each one, where were they, what, where, you know, where it was their home institution, where are they developing things. And to the other one is Google Analytics, looking at who is coming to our website over the years. And, and it's kind of, it's nice as a resource to go, oh, 197 countries have visited our resource. Uh, uh, other resources have been built in 42 other countries, they have right, yeah, 42 other countries um, using the dough. So just it's a nice global um, distribution. What it also shows is where we could improve, where a group, where areas we are not reaching those communities, where are our outreach opportunities from this. So it does guide um, how we develop, but it also identifies areas uh, where we need to develop as a resource. So the last four or five years, RNA-associated diseases have been very prominent more in literature, and they're using us, but we weren't necessarily representing them to the best of our ability. It wasn't one of our target areas of curation, so now it is. This slide's showing you just another way of thinking about who uses you, what's your user community. And again, how do you connect data different data types. And then in this example, obviously, for diseases, disease data connections 
help all these other types of diseases connect. And one other thing I didn't show on this slide uh, is all the ontologies that have been developed from the disease ontology. So when we started, there was no other disease ontology. I think back then there's probably a, a quite very small number of ontologies at all. You know, Go ontology, obviously, gene ontology uh, was the first. So when, after we've been uh, developed, there's, we know of now uh, at least 50 other ontologies that have been derived or utilized terms from the disease ontology. When I was putting this slide together, and you always kind of reflect and look back at what you've been doing, uh, I did add one last minute one, a source I only found out about last week through Twitter. Wasn't cited, was, I hadn't seen it on their website yet, I hadn't come to a conference yet and seen it on a poster in a talk, but um, I, I knew it was in the works, but PubChem, their RDF representation now includes the disease ontology, and that was just this past week. So, I mean, as a resource developer, it's wonderful to know who's using you, but again, it's informative to know how they're using you and for what types of data. And this is only a smidgen uh, of, of them, obviously. Um, was over, we know of over 360 resources, and we do publish this on our website, um, that, are, that we can document are using us. And, and the links to them are available if you want to explore those. One other role I think you may not um, be aware of, I want to make sure I mention, is part of uh, running a, a disease classification is rethinking the classification over time and rethinking them when other authoritative resources, in this case the WHO Blue Books, come out for cancers. Um, so this is, a, I mentioned a number of collaborations in the bottom and different areas we, we visit, but we do this all the time. We have different target areas of disease where we're reassessing based on what the community has been uh, redeveloping. In this case, uh, we were working on malignant gliomas. And you can see the classification changed quite a bit over time. So this is, it's, it's very fruitful for us to, again, we have a number of resources we do this with, and we have a schedule of going through them to make sure the new classifications are continually integrated. But importantly, those disease terms you have in your databases, you entered 15 years ago, 10 years ago, they aren't removed. We just identify where they need to be mapped into the new classification, or maybe they have to be merged. But those tracking, the IDs and the names, aren't lost, so the data can be tracked over time. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Um, so that's it for that slide. And I want to talk about a couple examples of ways people use us. Um, and I'm not going to go through all these examples, but I wanted to just mention that there are different types of uses, not just uh, maybe you're thinking someone's borrowing, using a disease term to annotate a particular disease, but there's whole systems that are built for different ways, and I thought it's fruitful to, to integrate those and include those. Okay. Now I want to get on to um, the fair and the trustworthy, but I just make sure I want to mention um, it really has been truly a village that has developed the dough, and these are, are mentioning many, all the people that have worked on it, but it's the different roles. You have clinicians, you have data wranglers, you have ontologists, you have engineers. We're all part of a big team to put this kind of resource together and to continue uh, putting it together, make sure they're acknowledged. Okay, now fair. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not gonna read through all these, but I think it's fruitful for any resource to think about how are you fair? What are the things you're doing concretely in your resource um, to be fair? Are you, how, how are your identifiers handled? Are you using other, say, Obo Foundry ontologies? Um, what is your licensing? I, it's very helpful you know, for me as, as a PI of the product to really think about how are we being fair? How can we improve our fairness by documenting it and kind of revisiting it every so often? And next, trustworthy. Again, what are the components of the work we're doing where we can improve our trustworthiness? Where can we be more transparent? Um, where can we have a better infrastructure technology? Here I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting our advisory board. Probably some of them are very uh, familiar to this audience. But again, I think it's really fruitful for any resource to start thinking about this and sharing this out to their community. And this is the second to last slide, but I really wanted to leave you with thinking about, as again, I said at the beginning, I've been reflective. This is a very reflective year. It's 20 years in a project. I honestly certainly didn't expect to be working on this project or leading it 20 years down the road. But it does bring to mind many things, I think, that are, are pivotal for building any of our types of resources. You have to have a mission. Yeah, that has to be at the forefront of things you're doing. You have to keep that in mind, because um, there's going to be many things that are coming at you, diversions of your scope, new resources you want to work with. And I think these are just things, fruit, food for thought, as you're developing resources. Um, I think that one thing in here, the responsibility lies with you to hold the integrity of the resource. Michael Ashburner told me that. 15 plus years ago. It really does, when you're building a resource that's going to be a community resource in particular, the, the buck stops with you. 
And so you have to, you, you work with your community, you hear them, get to know them very well. But again, you have to make the, be the decision maker and the responsible party. Get to know your community and um, hear their, their thoughts, bring their, in, their ideas in. It always makes you richer, but in the end, realize that you do have to make those decisions and then you, you share that back out. The community makes you richer. I think that's really the, the gist of this slide. And then I just want to make sure I thank uh, uh, my, my current team uh, and, and then share them with you. Uh, clinician team's at the top of the slide. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, we are on Twitter. Please tweet us. Um, we do have a new uh, public Slack. If you want to go chat with us about diseases, um, people like to have different ways to communicate. So on our Twitter is the link to our public Slack. You can go check that out. And, and please have many conversations with us. And I thank you for your time. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Yes, we do have time for questions. Up in the back. This one there. And please visit us at poster four. Uh, we do have some microbes left, so. Hello, thank you, Lynn, for the great talk. So you changed your license from CC BY to CC zero, right? Yes. Uh, I want to know a little bit about the impact that it had on the citations on the on the impact of your our work in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely had an impact for pharma. It was one big one that I know of. Um, for, for Wikidata, as uh, we were committed to that community, we actually were funded with them for eight years for promoting the data out and having it as publicly available as possible. We certainly have had more uptake for uh, other ontologies. I mean, you know, if you have a CCBY license, you, I'm not sure you can enforce it. But at the same time, I think I want to encourage others to use it instead, and, you know, Reuse is better than reinvention, I think, in many cases for ontologies. So yes, we definitely see an increase in the, the citations, um, but I think some of it is also, uh, we're doing a better job at capturing the citations. I mean, I used to, full disclosure, go through PubMed, look at each of the papers we've ever written, who cited us, and doing that quarterly, ugh, brutal. Uh, having an automated way to do it, um, and uh, that software is publicly available as well on our website, and Alan will be happy to talk about it later. It does have an impact. Uh, it does also have, you, you do lose the control, and some control, because you're not asking anyone to attribute you anymore, and people can take your resource and re mix and match it any way they want. But for me, honestly, I love every instance of it. If they're gonna use it, reuse it. It's, it's better out there than them having to reinvent the wheel. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? I think we're good. Any more questions? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>